For those of you who are here for the first time, I hope you're happy here and that you find a message that can help you. To those of you who were here last week, welcome again. We decided last week that we were going to adopt a very unusual procedure in reading the Bible. We were going to see Jesus not as a human form. We were going to see Jesus as light. We were going to see Jesus as the fourth dimension so that every time the name Jesus came to our attention, we would see not a form but light, not a three-dimensional man, but something of a fourth-dimensional nature so that the fourth dimension would be moving through three-dimensional man to teach him. Strangely enough, last Sunday, our theme was that life is without beginning and without end, that life is eternal, and it was just two days later that the world mourned the death of a man. It was on Tuesday, I think, that Bobby was shot. And it was all day yesterday that the world, millions, lined up in processions and on TV. There was a mourning, an acceptance of death. Perhaps not in the few who had come into the understanding that life is truly eternal. Now, if you remember, it was about November of 63 that Jack received the same bullet. And when it happened, the world was probably even more shocked than today, for this man was already the President of the United States. What was learned from that was very little. And the repetition of it, again, would indicate that we are going to learn just as little now unless we are able to stand four square and face this immediate situation of assassination with the truth taught to us by the Master. Today we want to do that. We want to face what the world calls death and to see why it has no existence and then to go a step further and to find out why one individual knowing the truth about life could accept death and what principle is in that acceptance of death which brings you into the realization of life? Now, Bobby is not dead. Bobby Kennedy could not die any more than Jesus could die. However, you will notice that even Abe Lincoln with a little book in his pocket all the time, was assassinated. You will notice that Martin Luther King, who taught the Bible, was assassinated, and that Jack and Bobby, both very devout Catholics, were assassinated. And you must say, somewhere along the line, where is God in the picture? Now, there's a passage in Proverbs here, and it says this, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. We perish where there is no vision, we are happy when we keep the law. Now, we have thought that men like Lincoln, Kennedy's king, were men of vision, men who kept the law. But it says here you don't perish when you keep the law. And so we have a contradiction of our own beliefs. Now, it would appear 
that we don't know what keeping the law means. And it would also appear that the master who taught eternal life never reached the inner ear of our present civilization. Now we have the face of a man in front of us on a cross and we see some men come up with a sword and pierce him and the water and the blood spurts out. We have merely passed that by without thinking of it in terms of our piercing the Christ in the same way. We have not thought that our civilization is piercing the Christ. But be sure that the symbology of that on the cross very aptly expresses our own ignorance. Now, in today's paper, you will find this funeral cortege and all the great names of our present civilization in the United States present, certain famous and illustrious men, pallbearing, and suddenly we have a situation which brings to life a perfect headline which Jesus himself wrote for this event. He said, let the dead bury the dead, and they're doing it. He meant it. He meant it to cover those of us who are unaware that death does not exist in our Father's house. And he used strong language to do it, language that brought many an exclamation from the Pharisees around him. Let the dead bury the dead. You see, when it comes home to the present civilization, we say, oh, he couldn't have been speaking about us. But we're here to face the fact that he was speaking about us. He was not only speaking about us, but everything he did was for the purpose of awakening us from a sleep. A sleep that is going on today with the same vigor and unawareness that has maintained this sleep in mankind since the Garden of Eden days. And this sleep must be faced. We must awaken from it. We must trace the steps of the Master without flinching from the truth. We have a man who said there is no death but did something that no other man had done. He said, I'm going to prove it. Now suppose on TV, instead of watching a funeral, you had watched the crucifixion. Suppose you had watched the crucifixion and three days later you had seen the same man appear. Do you think you'd get the point? Don't put it back there. Put it right here and now. Do you think Bobby's going to walk back in three days? What would happen if he did? What would you think or feel? And yet the point is that the spirit is capable of doing just that. The Spirit is capable of walking back in three days in the same form. Let's bring our teaching up to date. And let's see that no man is doing it for a very simple reason. That we are not aware of what the Master taught us. We are very much unaware and because of our unawareness, it is not only the truth of eternal life that we're missing, but we're missing the abundance, the health, the harmony, the beauty, the truth, the perfection of that life. We're missing the peace of that life. In these times of election, the words are bandied about that this one will bring us peace and this one will bring us peace. This one will bring us economic security. And this one will save our face so that we can retrench. Each one is extolling his own virtues. I haven't heard once anyone say 
that God knows the way. I haven't heard anyone say that there is a way and it isn't the way of mankind or the will of man or the mind of man. There is a total and complete absence of belief that there is a living God. We're going to vote for this man or that man, this party or that party. Even when Bobby hadn't yet passed on, what was the big worry in the minds of men in politics? Who would get the votes if he wasn't around? And if he was around and did recover, would the votes stay with him? That's about all that was on the mind of politicians. They weren't concerned about Bobby. Suddenly he's a gentle lion, an idealist, a great humanitarian. McCabe said he wanted the presidency so much his teeth hurt. We change overnight and the papers change overnight. The papers are selling papers and that's all they're selling. They're not selling truth. And the politicians are not selling truth. There may be an exception in this case. There may be one who is an exception, but that's for you to judge. The point to be made is this. We must translate the world scene into a spiritual universe or we are walking in the same funeral preparing our own place in that coffin. There is too much of futility in the world today where there should be hope. Too much pessimism and fear where there should be confidence. Now make no mistake about it. When the Master decided to teach us the meaning of life to give up his own to do it this was a willing demonstration in which he personally accepted the challenge to move through death into life to show the non-existence of death and it is very important that you know this and that you know it on biblical authority that you carefully trace each step he took so we must do that. We must establish beyond your doubt that he accepted crucifixion, that he wanted crucifixion, and he wanted it in obedience to an inner command which said this is the way it must be done. And I'll tell you why you must come to that conclusion. Because the only way that he could accept it is the only way that you can find the same confidence that he found. Unless you know his secret, you cannot walk the path of eternal life. And so you must find his secret. You must know why a man could say, I go, but I will return. I go to my father's house and to your father's house. But fear not, little flock. I send the comforter to you. My peace, my peace I give unto you. My joy I give unto you. He's walking to his crucifixion and telling them, I give you my peace and my joy. And then he says to the father, Thank you, father. And now glorify me. I do this not only for these my disciples, but for those who follow later who will also accept thy word that they may know there is no death in truth. What was his secret? Why could he do that? Let's see how he says it. He tells us all the way. Now, we're going to detail this very carefully. We're probably going to stay in the book of John 
more than the other Gospels because John, of the four, was the one who understood the spirit of Jesus. The others were more like Thomas, who believed what they saw, the physical man who also believed that here was the Messiah. And even when he had risen, they had a risen Messiah. They had a new Lord God, but they didn't have his message. They were worshiping the man even after he had risen, and he knew they misunderstood what he had done. They thought, now the Messiah has come back. He's going to leave us out of servitude. But it wasn't his intention to do that. It was his intention to lead mankind out of the servitude to ignorance. The message was the point, not the man. I of my own self can do nothing. But we still don't have the message because we still worship the man. In moments of fear and anxiety, we still say, Oh, Jesus, come to me. Or we turn to God. But we haven't turned to the God that he taught us to turn to. Because that was his secret. That was his discovery. He knew where God was and who God is. And our great leaders today haven't the slightest idea of who God is and where God is. And until we know that, we too must perish literally we must perish to return again to search again for that which has already been revealed but ignored now let's take his words and not our own opinions he says now is the judgment of this world. And he's speaking here about his judgment of the world. He is moving toward crucifixion. And he says, now is the judgment of the world. That's the judgment of the world, that when you get crucified, you're dead. And he's going to test the judgment of the world. He doesn't have a human enemy. He's not out to show up the Pharisees. He's not out to make Pilate look like a fool. He's not even out to defeat the Roman Empire. He is out to do something far greater. And this has been his major mission. He is out to show the judgment of the world about death is incorrect and he says so now shall the prince of this world be cast out we've never really understood who that prince was the prince of this world shall now be cast out he's going to expose the fallacy of that prince called death I am going to expose that there is no death I shall cast out the prince of this world. Why prince? Because death rules this world. That's the prince. It rules this world by instilling us with fear and anxiety and insecurity. We live under the shadow of it. It is therefore the ruler of man, the god of man, death itself, the very devil. But now I am going to expose this, he says. The prince of this world shall be cast out. Now here are some other points he makes very clear to us. We're in John 12 now. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. 
Now, he has been told what to do. He makes that statement. He doesn't say a single word except the words that he has been told to speak. In other words, he's under direct orders. But did you see him receive any telegrams or letters? Did somebody come to him with a wireless or a cable? How did he receive those orders? That's his secret, isn't it? But did he come to keep secrets or to give you secrets? He is telling us the word of God. Where does it come from? The kingdom of God was within him. God is spirit. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of spirit is within him. And within him, he receives the word of God. Is it important to us? Well, yes. Because he turns right around and says, the kingdom of God is within you. Just the way I'm receiving guidance from God, so can you. But my kind of guidance is so incredible to the world that even though it tells me to go out and get crucified, I believe it. That's how much I believe in this communication from God to me, that I'm following it to the letter. And will I be vindicated or not? Because if I fail, if this isn't God's communication to me to go and do what I'm doing, I will fail. And if I can't walk back out of this circumstance... If I fail, well, three years have been wasted and nobody will believe my message. So you see, I'm not only expressing total faith in the fact that God communicates to man from within and telling you that he does with you too, but I'm going to prove it. He has told me that I will walk back again and I'm going to do it in total faith. And on that proof, I will rest my message. That would make a pretty good trial lawyer. One who could rest his message on that proof. That I can walk out of this scene against the judgment of the world that that is death and then walk back and even convince doubting Thomas that it's the same me. On that, I will rest my case that all that I have taught is true. And then, if you see that is true, then all that I have taught should be of importance to you, including that the kingdom of spirit is within you, and as I receive communication from God from within, you too. And then go a step further. If you don't receive communication from God from within, you are dead. Because that communication from within is called the Word. And unless that Word is made into your flesh, you are dead. Or assassinated. You must live by the Word of God. And it comes from within. It spins itself out like a spider and becomes your flesh. Take a seed. Put it out here on the table. Just a seed. What happens to it? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. It could stay there for a hundred years and it will not grow. Why? Because it must be put into the earth. And then from inside the earth, it will draw that which it needs. It is dead until it is put in its natural element until it is connected up to that earth. And then life within it, which is in it all the time, begins to come forth as a tree, as a bush, or as a fruit. Man is a seed. And unless that seed is connected to life, that seed cannot grow. 
unless that seed is connected to the word of God, which is life, that seed cannot grow. It is cut off. It is a branch cut off. Now that seed, this Hindu mystic that Joel told us about, said to his disciples, bring in a fruit, and they did. He said, cut it open, and they did. What do you find? And they said, a seed. Good. Cut the seed open. They did. What do you find there? Well, nothing. Nothing. Ah, he said, that's the point. What is there is life, and you can't see it. But without it, the seed can't go anywhere. That which you cannot see in the center of the seed is the life of the seed. And it's going to make the tree. It's going to grow that seed. This little infant is a seed too. And the life in the center of that seed is going to grow that seed. And that life in the center of the seed is called the word. It can lie there just like a seed on this table and that seed won't grow. If that word lies in that seed unnoticed, you're looking at the living dead. You're looking at a living dead human race if that seed is unnoticed. If that word is not accepted in consciousness, you do not see life. You see an imitation. And that imitation is devoid of the harmony, the peace, the abundance, the fullness of God, because there has been no connection between the outer man and the living word of God in the seed of that man. Now, Jesus is revealing all this in his march to life after death. He is showing you that the word of God in him is the only God that he follows. That's his God. That living word within. And now he's following it to do what no man dares do. He tells you again. He says, I am going to lay down my life that I may pick it up again. In advance, I'm going to lay down my life. What manner of man can do this? I am the light, he says, of the world. I am not in this world. I am the light of the world. And he proceeds all along the way to carefully make clear that he is doing this of his own volition in complete obedience to the voice within. This is no arbitrary human whim at self-glory. This is complete obedience to his father within. And all the while, he is teaching his disciples a great lesson about life. That the father within is the only guide you can follow. If you follow your own perceptions, your own beliefs, your own ideas, your own glory, you are a man who ultimately will be a branch cut off. I am the vine. You take the branches of the tree, you cut away the trunk, and there are your branches all individually separated from each other. Nothing is flowing through them from that tree anymore. Of course, they're going to die. Now, Jesus, at this moment, is not a branch cut off, but he's walking among men who are branches cut off. And he's showing them the difference. There's no single man on earth at this moment, he says, who can do this because you're all branches cut off. Look what you can do if you're not a branch cut off. The difference between a branch cut off and one that isn't is that Jesus was aware within himself 
of the presence of God. And this made him the vine, one with the father who was the husbandman. And so the branch, the human branch, was fed by the inner word, the Christ, which in turn was fed by the husbandman, the father. The husbandman, the vine or trunk, and the human branch, which appeared as Jesus, were one. And no matter where Jesus walked, he was sustained by the father, the husbandman, because Jesus was connected to the vine, the trunk, called the Word, the Christ, the divine principle, the Father within. And that is the secret of why he could say, I have meat the world knows not of. That is the secret of why he felt confident that he could lay down his life and pick it up again. And it is the secret that he conveyed to us in a manner that no other man has ever done. Now for us to turn right around and mourn for the death of anyone is to turn away from this teaching which is telling you that death is merely that appearance which follows the individual who does not turn to the word of God within himself so that he be made whole with the trunk, with the vine, with the father within. And the fact that the human race doesn't do it doesn't change the teaching. For there are those who can pass out of this flesh into the truth of being into the permanent eternal life there are those who can walk this earth now in the flesh not subject to the chances the vicissitudes of this earthly life because they are in oneness with the word of God within themselves and rather than mourn the passing of others let us rejoice in the new found revelation that one who is one with the word of God within himself does not pass on ever if there were a conviction of this in us this would send us scurrying to the nearest quiet place in our homes that we might be hid in our closet as he instructed when ye pray, pray not as the heathens do, but hide in your closet. What does that mean? It means that you must find the word of God within you and open your consciousness to it. And lo and behold, I and the Father are one, and now no man on earth, no force on earth, no crucifixion, no assassin's bullet, no bomb, no automobile, no airplane, no disease, no germ is a power over the Spirit of God that animates my being. That's his message. Watch how confident he was of it. First we come to Isaiah. Isaiah knew all about this before Jesus ever appeared. Here's what he said. And he was speaking of the Jesus who would appear. He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. What was that veil, that covering? He would destroy death. He would destroy it by exposing it. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will swipe away, wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from all of the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. Do you see how the word of God is 
spoken through Isaiah is going to become flesh what can stop it do you see that that word is the power there will be a day when this will be the reality we all experience now Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy and he knew it he said it I am not of this world but more ye speaking of men judge after the flesh I judge no man today you see this comes back to haunt us ye judge after the flesh you look and you see somebody passing on or you look and you see suffering or you look and you see pain ye judge after the flesh but judge after the spirit and you will see my father's kingdom on earth he that loveth life will lose it can you understand that he that loveth life will lose it the reason he said that is because he was about to demonstrate that he didn't love life as we know it I love my father I honor my father and my father is not human life he that loveth his life shall lose it but he that hateth his life shall find it it's again time to stare that in the face he that hateth his life shall find it is the revelation of the true life the life that is the inner voice of God lifting you above the life that you have called life you say I don't have the faculty to understand that or to do it and the master says no no human being has there's only one way to understand it and to do it you have to become a child again you have to take this adult out here and say to the adult you haven't found your father you are moving into nothingness you are doomed to perish you must be a child again you must kill this old man and you must do this by turning to the vine the vine which is the life that comes through the seed you have diverted your life from that vine you have turned a deaf ear to that word you have become a prodigal from the inner word of God oh just because everybody on earth does it doesn't mean that you're under God's protection because you have done it too it means that you're without the hand of God upon you it means that you can be famous successful wealthy one moment and not around the next when will you learn how many examples must you see before you see that life itself is not something you experience in the outer that isn't life that's the result of life that's the effect of life that's the surface before you experience the outer if you do not experience the inner your outer is nothing it is a twig in the wind but if you labor 
to sow to the word to the spirit within that word will set up the pattern of your inner life which becomes the pattern of your outer life and no man can take that away for that is God itself now the disciples are completely unaware of what's going on at that moment he could have called his disciples Lyndon or Bobby or Jack he could have said to them what he said to his own disciples what I'm doing now you don't understand but I'm sending the comforter to you who will teach you what I am doing and then you will understand and Peter said well don't leave us now we don't know what to do and he talked to Peter and Peter finally said oh I understand now I understand and amusedly he looked at Peter and said do you really Peter have you the slightest idea and then he smiled and said three times you will deny me but it's all right Peter eventually you too will learn you and Lyndon and Bobby and the world and every mother and every father and every child will learn that what I do this moment is to point out where you must go if you would find life if you would live instead of sleep if you would accept me instead of piercing me and they're still seeing Jesus the man as we still see Jesus the man today and right now you must readjust your vision to see who is speaking these words these words are not coming from a man when Jesus speaks no man is talking when Jesus goes on a cross no man is going on a cross when Jesus returns in the flesh no man has returned life itself is making the demonstration and that life is called the Christ the father within that life is the life of the seed of your being and you must accept it in order for you to live in life that is why to know the word aright is life eternal to accept anything other than life eternal is to accept the opposite of life and to live in a substitute until the rude awakening we as he did must cast this prince of this world out of it out of our consciousness the acceptance of the possibility of death the mourning the belief that it exists is a contradiction of Christianity the very foundation of the Christian belief is that the Spirit of God alone could take what appears to be a man and lead him through that which the judgment of the world calls death returning again to establish that only God is power that only God life is power that death is without power when you are connected to the spirit of your being this is the foundation of Christianity on this foundation men who saw the return were persuaded to go forth and jeopardize their own lives because what we have seen we must speak of what we have heard we must tell 
with our own eyes. We saw him return. And they still didn't know why he returned, how he managed to do it. Thomas said, when he was finally convinced that this truly was the same one who had departed, he said, my Lord and my God. And how the master must have winced. I'm not your Lord and I'm not your God. I'm just a man who walked through death and came back because I knew how to live in obedience to the word of God within me. Now Paul was a little more advanced than Thomas. When Paul got the word, Paul went out. Paul did something about it. Paul told us about that word. He said, don't you realize that things seen are made of the substance of that which is unseen? He knew where the word was. He knew that the word was a reality, that there was a life within each man that no man suspected, and that that life was eternal life, and any man touching it would find the self-revealing light which brings with it the living treasures of the living kingdom of God on earth. Paul went on to prove as Jesus did and yet Paul could not make that transition that Jesus had made into death and back. Paul had to reincarnate. And his reincarnations probably gave us mystics that we're not aware of as reincarnation of Paul, just as John the Baptist was a reincarnation of Elijah. But you see, this truth within us, this word, forms the very beginning of your fourth gospel. John well aware of what had happened begins his gospel with this great revelation of the secret of Jesus Jesus had the word of God within him and was advising us that it's within us but it was a light in the darkness the darkness comprehended it not we do not to this day comprehend that the word dwells among us but here and there one is aware and that one that one is on the way to peace on earth in the midst of war to love on earth in the midst of hate that one is going to find that the living word of God in him, in her is security, protection life itself And I'm not satisfied that we yet have the fullness of his message about life eternal. But I do know this, that if you think of death again, you're going to have to stop and say to yourself, am I not living 2,000 years ago instead of in this illuminated age? Am I going to be just another Paul bearer to falsehoods that were dead when the Master revealed that they never existed? Or am I going to rejoice in the fact that my life is eternal and then go out and prove it? Then go out and find the Father within and then live in obedience to the Father within and prove just as Jesus did that the Father within knoweth my needs and it is his pleasure to give me the kingdom it is his pleasure to sustain me to nurture me to guide me to perfect that which concerneth me to go before me to prepare a table for me these must become our individual truth that we accept and live by. So we're going to have to go to this word, and that is what we'll study. 
after we just have a few minutes of relaxation.